Hello and welcome to HT After Hours. The third chapter is a little bit shorter and we're getting more into the biblical roots of gender and the reason for the tensions that exist between the sexes. You don't have to agree with the author's logic, but it's still a great chance to discuss and work at our spirituality. Men don't talk. Might be true, but that men don't talk easily about spirituality is definitely a hurdle that will have to be surmounted. Again, this material is obviously for women as well. As will become clear, men need women's wisdom on this matter if we're to move forward. First, a verse to read, then chapter 3. Male and female, God created them. In the Bible, humanity is created both male and female in order to image God. All healthy spirituality will always have a truly sexual character to it, a desire for reunion. Religion is always, in one sense or another, about making one out of two. Cheap religion is invariably about maintaining the two and keeping things separate. For countless ages, culture and society have emphasised the differences between men and women rather than their underlying unity. Despite the endless fascination of the sexes for one another, social customs have sharply distinguished maleness from femaleness and sexual morality has been concerned with keeping men and women apart. As society has taught us to regard the opposite sex with suspicion and our culture has bred in us a spirit of competition for different forms of power. Since most cultures have been patriarchal or dominated by men, women are often viewed as an oppressed group in society. Men have all the visible power and women are the losers. In my own reflections on the male-female tension, however, I've come to see that both of us are the losers. We're deprived of that healthy wholeness and I would even say holiness which comes from integrating both the masculine and the feminine. I would like to suggest that men even suffer greater deprivation than women. As one of Jesus' most popular one-liners says very clearly, the last will be first and the first last. It's not good to be on the top. Women can often compensate for the role in which they have been cast by finding power in indirect ways, such as subtly learning to manipulate and cajole for their needs. It made them much more creative in the ways of power. In other words, they learned the dance between power and powerlessness in ways that men never did. We men have not had a similar avenue open to us. Female behaviour was so strictly taboo that men have been discouraged from recognising and developing the feminine dimensions within themselves. Women have developed both parts and have a significant head start in understanding the very nature of spirituality, particularly Christian spirituality. In recent years, theologians in the third world have made it very clear that much 
of the gospel proclaimed by Jesus and lived by the early church was concerned with liberation in this world as now so later. The good news, the root meaning of the word gospel, is that people can be freed from the oppression, illusion and death that binds them. Heaven is only its continuation. The first people to accept and respond to the gospel message of liberation were, of course, the poor and the powerless. They were blessed because they knew that they were unwhole and in need of healing, in need of salvation. Much of Jesus' teaching, however, was directed not at the poor, but at the rich, not at the weak, but at the powerful. Jesus evidently saw the oppressors, often typified as the scribes and Pharisees, with an even greater need because they were trapped by their own self-sufficiency. It's still true today. The rich are deprived by their own wealth. The powerful are victimised by their own positions and the oppressors are oppressed by their own domination. If this is the case, then women have nothing to gain by turning the situation upside down. Some feminists seem to believe that if the male-female roles could be reversed, women would be liberated from oppression in our patriarchal society and that gender affirmative action will resolve all our problems. If the roles are simply reversed, women would come just as trapped as men are now, but in a matriarchal or woman-dominated system. The liberating gospel of Jesus is that salvation is found not in domination but in partnership, not in power wielding but in power sharing. The poor are not saved by robbing the rich, the weak are not saved by conquering the strong, the oppressed are not saved by making the masters their slaves. Turning the tables simply perpetuates the sinful human situation that Jesus was engaged in redeeming. The spiritually whole person integrates within himself or herself both the masculine and feminine dimensions of the human spirit. She or he is androgynous, a word derived from the Greek for man and woman. It's fascinating that some tribes and civilizations considered the man-woman to be the shaman, the wise man, the spiritual seer. They were the image of divine wholeness. Androgyny is the ability to be masculine in a womanly way and to be feminine in a manly way. It probably takes the work of a lifetime to get there which is the beauty we often see in older men and women. The young man is all male and the young girl is all sugar and spice. If you read classic legends and myths, note how you invariably meet the strong old woman and the kind old man by the end of the story. That's the goal.